This painting, inspired by the Gospel of John, was meant to be placed high up on a wall and observed from down below. It most probably was part of a triptych placed over an altar. The painter, Quentin Matzies, was Antwerp's most celebrated artist in the early 16th century. He was self-taught and had made his living as a blacksmith until he fell in love with a painter's daughter. The claustrophobic gathering of figures with their vile faces and malicious expressions invites the viewer to feel just a little of the torment Jesus felt after he was scourged and presented to the crowd who demanded his crucifixion. The work is called Ecce Homo, which is Latin for Behold the Man. These are the words ascribed to Pilate, who was looking for a way to free Jesus by torturing him through beatings, flagellation, and mock adornment, in order that the crowd might view him and take pity. But they did not. Instead, they demanded his death. Here the horrible facial contortions show an Italianate influence on the painter who must have been inspired by the caricatured grotesques of Leonardo da Vinci. The grimaces and the bizarre facial expressions create a vicious circus surrounding the figure of the tortured but noble Christ standing next to the cautious, conflicted pilot. Within the more exaggerated art of caricature comes a stockade of stereotypes, and here Matzies has taken the figures at the bottom of the painting and turned them into a vicious cartoon spectacle. Following his reading of scripture, he has placed the Jews below Pilate's balcony agitating for the death of Jesus. They sport precious jewelry and have hooked noses and fleshy lips. The high priest is cloaked with a tasseled hood. His eyes are deliberately hidden because he is being portrayed as blinded by hatred and unable to perceive Christ's true identity. Up above, the soldiers are made to look like brutal ruffians. They wear helmets and brandish weapons and hold the double-headed eagle flag of the Holy Roman Empire. The work has a contemporary look for 16th century Northern Europe, but yet it is striving for the exotic embellishments of the imagined ancient Middle East. While the architecture is northern Gothic, the decorations are antique, pagan, and symbolic, all referring to the figure of Christ. Above Christ's thorn-pricked head is a statue of charity, or caritas, as she is called in Latin. Drawn from ancient Roman prototypes of charity depicted as a woman offering nourishment through her breast, this female can be compared to the Christianized allegory of Caritas, tenderly holding a child who is suckling while other children crawl around her. Likewise, Christ offers his own life through charity and feeds us with his blood in the Eucharist. Earlier depictions of charity depicted a figure holding a candle or flame or spark of light, and interestingly, this has been transposed by Matzies to the figure of Hermes, known as Mercury in the Latin world, shown standing here on a pedestal at the far right. Zeus chose Hermes to be his special messenger to the gods of the underworld, and there he is a parallel with Christ. The Apostles' Creed declares that Christ descended to the dead after the crucifixion to free those waiting for their redemption. Hermes was originally an agrarian deity, the tutelary god of the shepherds, and in this context, he appropriately parallels the Good Shepherd of Christianity. And as a messenger, Hermes was the bearer of good news. He maintained communication between heaven and earth and guaranteed safe passage from the underworld. Could a more appropriate pagan figure adorning Pilate's palace be chosen as a reference to Christ, who connects heaven with the earth and the underworld? The bloodthirsty mob declared that Christ had given himself the title King of the Jews, and so Pilate gave Jesus an ignominious coronation. Here the crown is presented as a helmet more than a wreath, and the purple cloak placed upon Christ's shoulders is another reference to his kingship. When Pilate presented Christ to the crowd and uttered the words Ecce Homo, he was presenting the Savior wounded and bloody and battered, to a world that was blind to his salvific mission. And yet, as scripture tells us, 
By his wounds we have been healed. They are, in essence, the receipt of our redemption.